Good evening and welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Uh, Tom is out tonight, so we're down to two of us. Today is Monday, January 31st, 2022, and uh, call to order at uh, 6.34 p.m. Uh, let's just do our minutes uh, real quick and get that out of the way. We have a motion on the minutes from I, January 24th. A motion we accept the minutes from January 24th. All right, and I'll second. All those in favor of the minutes of January 24th? Aye. Aye. All right, two to zero. All right, and now <clears throat> next up on our agenda for uh, stuff tonight, we've got a legislative update with uh, Senator Comerford and Rep. Lay, who are graciously appearing on Zoom with us tonight. And we've got a Sunderland Public Library budget presentation after that. And then a quick discussion on, uh, which we do pretty much every year, a request a deficit spend for snow and ice. And a discussion on the Boston Post Cane recipient. And then on our regular things, we've got a header for ARPA discussion and any um, select board and town administrator updates. So. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to, um, I don't know, which one of you would like to go first? Better, please. All right. Oh, you're so good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having us tonight. Uh, you know, um, and I'm really grateful to Rep. Lay and to Corinne uh, for scheduling these. And I'm joined tonight by Elena Cohen, um, who's district director for our team. And just let me start by saying, and I know that Ripley and I share this hope that we listen more than we talk, because this is our chance to hear from the town of Sunderland. Um, just let me say, you know, it remains an honor to serve this community in partnership with uh, Natalie Blay. Um, and this session uh, continues to call my attention to public health matters and to COVID-19 emergency preparedness and um, ensuring actually that the Commonwealth is more prepared, more resilient, more able to meet the next uh, disaster equitably. And I will say one of the focuses of the work of the committee, um, one of the two committees I chair, is on you know issues of regional equ equity when it comes to emergency preparedness and response. You know, and ways in which the committee has heard through multiple hearings uh, about the disproportionate burdens, especially in our region. Uh, but of course also into the Berkshires um, that people faced uh, when you know confronting this contagion, this current contagion. And that's across across all issues um, and all sectors. So I uh, you know getting to represent this beautiful 24 cities and towns and then getting to do this work really uh, is a, a I believe it's just a, a great moment for us to really as a Commonwealth look at how we build back better. I'll just say, and then getting to live in this community, um, you know, the work has become very personal for me, um, quite frankly. Um, so at this moment uh, in the legislative cycle, and Natalie will make this better, um, we're approaching something called Joint Rule 10. It's a completely arcane term, meaningful to probably no one, maybe except the clerks. But we're supposed to, in our committee work, um, report out fully on all of the bills before us. So public health, one of the two committees I have, has about 387 bills. And that's where I've been putting a lot of my focus. And I'll say these bills are meaningful, including the State Action for Local Public Health Excellence, or SAFE. Uh, again, this is a way that the work I do in Boston is really meaningful um, in terms of its impact here in Western Massachusetts. So that's Wednesday, and so that's really all we've been focused on in this last sort of short-ish window. Um, but soon after, uh, we're going to head to a lot of focus on money, and that looks like the capital bond, um, that looks like ARPA II, um, as it were, that's what the slang in our office is, you know, we're going to have another tranche of ARPA funding, we know we'll have another supplemental budget, which is, of course, not unusual, and then we'll have the, the next fiscal year budget. Um, and so, you know, I really look forward to hearing from Sunderland about your priorities and the way in which I should be working with Replay both on priority legislation that you favor um, and also in money. Uh, and let me just say, in terms of priority legislation, the perhaps the most acute uh, piece of legislation held in our team currently is a bill I have in partnership with Replay on municipal buildings. Um, and that has been you know, one of the ways in which uh, getting to partner in, in our town efforts 
um, is actually that much more exponential because Natalie and I also share a number of bills and a number of budget priorities. Um, and we believe very strongly together, uh, and maybe Natalie will expand on this, that the, the Commonwealth owes, uh, especially small towns, the same kind of support that we give schools and libraries. Uh, and that is, it's a pain point for us out in Western Massachusetts not having that support. So that's going to be one of the focuses um, our team brings into ARPA uh, to match the legislation that Natalie and I have been working on. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, I don't want to over talk, and I'll hand it over to you, Natalie. And um, I look forward to hearing from some of them. Thank you. Well, it's great to be sitting down the street from you all at 157 North Main Street. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> And good to see so many of our, our Sonora Public Library friends here. Uh, uh, Joe and I are tremendous supporters of our local public libraries for all of the things that you do. And so I just want to say thank you specifically to the Sonora Public Library for all that you do for the town. Uh, and to say how grateful I am to be doing this work alongside Senator Comerford and Elena and my legislative aide, uh, Corinne Coriat. Uh, who really just give it all every single day to our districts and our constituents and our communities. And, and we couldn't do this work without you. Um, and if you're wondering about the weird backlighting, I'm in my kids' room and I'm trying to hide the <laughs> mess that's right behind me. It's not that I'm like trapped in some box. That's, that's what I'm doing right now. Um, but I do especially want to thank you for your partnership on the, the bill that Senator Comerford and I offered an act creating a municipal and public safety building authority. Uh, the testimony that you submitted was incredibly powerful and helped us to lift up the, the very unique challenges that many of our rural communities are facing across the Commonwealth when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, the dollars that we have are being stretched incredibly thin, and the bottom line is that we need to be putting more money into our communities however we can. Uh, this is one way. Another way is the work that, that we're doing Rules Commission uh, to begin to identify the real challenges that our rural schools are facing and how we can lift them up and and uh, draw resources towards them. That report is due this spring, and I really hope to be able to change the way that that we are looking at um, how our rural schools can uh, succeed in support in supporting their students and supporting our teachers and our parents. Uh, because we all value our schools and um, had the opportunity to be at Sunderland Elementary recently uh, to talk about being a state representative and talk to these incredible students who were uh, donating food to the food bank and uh, our, our schools just play such an important role in our communities and we need to do a better job as a commonwealth of supporting them and supporting you because it certainly I know is a challenge when it comes to the budget in terms of the limited resources that we have and, and the decisions that you make. Um, and then finally, I just want to give a shout out to the town for the incredible work that you've done on Riverside Park uh, and in whatever way that we can help you um, expand that beautiful resource that we have here in Sunderland. Uh, I, think, I think you know that we're here for you and we stand ready to support you on that and any of the other issues that, that you bring up this evening. And at that, I just want to turn it over to you. Thanks. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Do we have anything? Uh... wanted to bring up at all Jeff or? um no I, I just wanted to say that I saw that the the um, mosquito control district stuff is starting to pop up again so um, we know that um, both the senator and representative have, have worked hard and heard our, our concerns with the way it was run last year and um, really appreciate you staying on top of it and letting us know that it you know now that it's picking up again and now is the time i think uh the next couple of weeks there's there's going to be a listening session and and um recommendations for improving the way it went and so i, I know that that was a, a concern last year and oh, so just wanted to thank you both for for staying on top of that as well 
I actually can't believe I didn't talk about bugs. How <laughs> was it that we, I talked to you unbelievable people and we didn't talk about mosquitoes. Um, so absolutely, thank you. And I just, Sunderland's forbearance and your tenacity and your skill with the way you're handling um, this situation is really truly moving um, and much to be respected. And the state has to do better. Um, and it is uh, because we were uh, chair of public health last session, basically, as you know, the history here is that the governor sent a bill which would have basically permitted spraying of any um, element, anytime, anywhere, really, <laughs> until the end of time, right? There was no end date. Um, and, and the legislature said, no, the House and Senate, I worked really closely with Natalie Blay on this. And, um, and so we passed a bill that called it to being this 21st century task force to really rethink the way that we um, mitigate the spread of uh, mosquito-borne illnesses. Um, and, you know, and you're right to call us to a better process for opting out or engaging with the state. It was not good enough last year. Um, and I, you're right that there's a listening session that's coming up. I, I look forward, Elena, I look forward, I'm sure Rep. Lay and Corinne do too, to you know, engaging with Sunderland to making sure your voice is heard by the state. Um, the task force is a robust body. It's, it's, a, it's a task force not in name only. There are good people on the task force who was passed forward by the legislation. And um, you know, engaging is a smart thing for us all to do because um, they will develop a policy that we hope is worlds better um, than we had before. So thank you for raising that. Appreciate it. I think especially uh, with your help with the uh, municipal building bill, because I sit on two different capital planning committees and I see a lot of planning and things that need to be done and things we've you know, necessarily had to put off over the years just because of just trying to keep things running. So trying to get a better grip on that and hopefully tackle that so as well. So it's been, it's been an interesting couple of years. So <clears throat> anybody have any other, uh, any comments for, uh, our senator and our rep at all. Quiet group this Monday, I think. I mean, we've got oh. a lot of things I know. Since Tom isn't here, I do want to talk about RTAs. Yes, ah, <laughs> there you go. I, you know, I, I just want to give Tom credit for, for always being a tenacious advocate for the expansion of services in the region and definitely yep. collaboration between the FRTA and the PBTA. Um, we're very hopeful that the bill that I sponsored alongside Senator Harriet Chandler, uh, which is an act to increase regional transit accessibility in the Commonwealth, uh, will make it through the Transportation Committee by Wednesday. And, and that bill will increase you know, and ensure adequate funding for our RTAs. It dedicates a portion of Uber and Lyft fees, which we just don't have out here, to support RTAs, which sort of fill that gap when we don't have a strong Uber and Lyft network. Uh, and it will help to electrify RTA buses, provide support for RTA capital budgets, and, and really stop the use of uh, it's a performance metric that really deepens inequities, uh, which is called the fare box recovery ratio. And I'm really hopeful that we're able to get that bill across the finish line and, and be able to work with FRTA and PVTA uh, to talk about how we can make these better connections uh, with Sunderland being right in the middle of where yeah, those, those yeah. new agencies connect. And, and I do know that it has been something that Tom has been working very hard on and just want to acknowledge his efforts there. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And, and especially that coupled with other rail developments throughout the western part of the state and everything, I think is, is going to be very important for future economic development, especially going up and down the corridor from the north to south. And then if we can connect that link back to Boston, that would be great. So thank you. You know, you mentioned the, the intersection of rail. Um, so first, let me just say I so much love uh, Rep. Lay's um, leadership on the RTA issue, and it is so meaningful. Um, and in the House, and actually the whole legislature, Natalie is like one of the leading uh, voices really pushing this forward. I'm just delighted to support it. And, you know, uh, the delegation is also engaged in something, I don't know, it gets me super excited. There's a real emergent 
very, um, uh, I think, growing um, awareness in the whole delegation, and that's the four western counties, about the necessity uh, to capitalize on this moment with infrastructure dollars coming into the Commonwealth yeah. to really solidify a regional vision for rail. And so, you, you know, you mentioned the east-west, you know, uh, likely you know, via Springfield, which is the most, the furthest along east-west. Right. Um, a study that's happening. Of course, there's the north-south. That's the Valley Flyer, and that's something that Natalie and I have been working on um, protecting, as it were, the study, making sure that the study is, you know, has every ability to succeed. And then uh, our, our colleague Rep, uh, Senator Hines has a Berkshire Flyer, which is very meaningful for the Berkshire region. And then we have um, Ripley and I have the northern tier, the you know the west east from North Adams, um, stopping in Greenfield, say. Um, that would go into Boston and connect up with the Fitchburg line. And so in, we've engaged with our federal colleagues. Um, they've been exceedingly generous, both uh, Rep McGovern and um, Rep Neal. And so probably a greater percentage of, of our team's time is going to go into the rail vision and seeing what we can achieve at this prep precipice moment. Um, and it's pretty exciting. Great. Thanks. We really appreciate that. I think we have one question from uh, Wendy. Do you have a question? I see, I see your virtual hand up there. There I am. Hey, there you go. I, I want to give a big thank you for all the effort that is going into same day registration. And um, it's something that I think is very doable. But boy, keeping the integrity of an election is so important. And what the needs are to make same day registration um, credible and and having our voters feel like um, there's nothing funny going on or people are going to be able to do things in multiple places is really, really important. Massachusetts, I think, should be so proud of our election laws. I think we did some great big um, gains uh, during the presidential election. It was a lot of work, but boy, my numbers came out fine. It was big high numbers for Sunderland. Um, so it worked. Um, there were some things I think I would change, but I really appreciate all the time and effort that is going into making sure that the integrity of our elections is still in place and not just saying we're doing something just to say we're doing it. Right. I think that's, that's really big. And thanks to folks like you, Wendy. Appreciate it. I was just going to say, Wendy, you're a hero. Yep. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, so the House just took up uh, what is called the Votes Act this week. Um, and, and I have to say that, you know, what we were, well, first, I just want to really take a minute to acknowledge. what Wendy and all of the other town clerks did across the Commonwealth but particularly particularly in our rural communities um, the, the election integrity is is something that obviously we're concerned about but town clerks live it each and every single day and worry about it all the time and it's only because of people like Wendy and the town clerks across the first Franklin district that well across the Commonwealth as a whole that we are able to go into into those spaces and, and vote um, with with their good care and, and really um, wanting to do what's right for their the residents of their communities. Uh, so the Votes Act that we did just pass really uh, extends the voting reforms that we put into place during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it also strengthens provisions that were already in place for Massachusetts residents, including pre-registration for teenagers, automatic voter registration, online voter registration, and early voting. Um, there are so many things that the Votes Act did, both on the House side, which we just passed this last week, and then we set aside. Uh, there is now a conference committee that will be named to iron out the differences between those two bills. And, uh, and I think that there are positives in each bill that, that we need to be uh, considering and certainly advocating for going forward. Uh, 
the House version does ask the secretary to, um, to look at the costs associated and the feasibility of same-day voter registration in the cities and towns across the Commonwealth. And I think that that's something that, that he can do right now. You know, he can talk with our town clerks like Wendy to say, you know, what, what does it mean to, uh, to effectively implement same-day voter registration? so that uh, the conference committee has that information, that data right in front of them so that we're able to really bolster that case for same day voter registration and move it forward. Excellent. Yeah, Jeff. I, I guess I'd just say one thing, Senator Cumberford, you mentioned you're gonna be talking about money, moving into the money discussion. I know budgeting is hard. Um, the governor put out his budget, which had unrestricted general government aid increasing about 2.7 percent when cost of living is going up five percent we're likely to see inflation you know uh rates raised multiple times next year and um i think in his budget chapter 90 was level funded as well and you know that and i know that you there's also the the I'm going to get the name wrong, but rural roads legislation that, that you're both working on. And, and I don't know how that plays into Chapter 90, but um, don't think I'd be doing my job if I didn't say if we could get more Chapter 90 and Chapter 70 and unrestricted government aid and library aid on all those things. Um, you know, uh, but I do think, you know, 2.7% is, is great, but when we're th looking at 5% inflation, it, it's actually losing money. So I would just encourage you to look at that. Uh, and I, again, I understand budgeting. I can't imagine what budgeting on the state level <laughs> looks like and, and all the things that you have to consider, but um, just make a plug for that. Thank you. A good plug, especially with like the You're supply completely chain correct um, that the 2.7 hike is not enough for unrestricted uh, government aid. and. Um, also the chapter 90 money. And I will say that I, I have a lot of faith in, in the rural um, task force, the education task force that Rep. Lay is leading, because that's, that's, part of, um, that's part of what will help a community like Sunderland is really understanding how best to determine equity when it comes to education form, formulas um, for the smallest communities. But with regard to AGA, which is what the city calls it, I don't know if that's what the house calls it, um, and Chapter 90, this is on our, those are on our budget letters um, already, uh, and it, of course Chapter 70 is perennially there, uh, because we want to even hasten beyond what the Student Opportunity Act has done um, to try to achieve some regional equity. Uh, but I really appreciate you raising it, <laughs> and you absolutely have to, um, because that's our job, is to try to make the case that 2.7% increase when inflation's at 5%, um, just isn't keeping pace with what's real for local communities. Thank you. And I'm really hopeful that Chapter 90 will be raised by <coughs> that it needs to be, given how high revenue has been in the Commonwealth. Uh, if there was ever a time for us to be able to invest in that infrastructure, it's now. Uh, we had an incredible turnout in terms of the testimony that was offered in support of unpaved roads, which is legislation um, that I offered with Senator Hines and has the strong support of, of Senator Cumberford and others. And I have to say one of the benefits of, well, one of the bright sides of COVID was uh, being able to do things virtually and how, I can't tell you how incredible it was to have people from Leverett and Shutesbury and, and Goshen and you know, other places across Western Massachusetts giving testimony to the, com to the committee about how unpaved roads in the spring or after a major uh, storm effect is really impacting their lives. It's impacting their ability to get their kids to school. It's impacting their jobs. It's impacting emergency responders. And if we're able to, to pull money into our rural communities via this, you know, through this way, all, along our unpaved roads, uh, that would be a real win and it would supplement chapter 90 dollars in a way that i don't know that we would others otherwise access and the fact of the matter is that our rural communities are paying more to maintain these roadways of which we have a higher percentage than the majority of communities across the commonwealth so uh, i'm happy to say that that bill is being pulled right now by the transportation committee it um it has an extension until March 25th, 
uh, because it was just heard and the committee just needs a little bit more time to consider it. And it just calls for a working group for us to begin to look at the needs associated with, with our rural towns who are really spending a lot of time and resources uh, to maintain these roadways. I told them that I would take $8 million uh, instead of study. So we'll see. Maybe maybe they'll come through with that instead. But we'll see what happens. Thank you. And it's all the more prescient now, with, especially with the extreme weather events and everything that we've been having. You know, you've got terrible things that happen on the road, so it's very important. Well, thank you. Anybody have any other uh, questions or comments for our legislators? Hmm? Let me see. We're right just about on time, too, so that's perfect. Well, thank you very much. We both appreciate all you, uh, that you're doing for us, and we really look forward to all the other things we have to tackle coming up in the future. So we really appreciate it. Thanks for the update. Well, thank you so much for having us. All right, thanks. And uh, stay warm and safe out there. Thank you. And if I could just put in a good word for the library. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. It was good to see you. All right, thanks. Have a good night. Take care. Here. All right, next up on our agenda is the Sunderland Public Library presentation. Hey, how are you? Yeah. Good, thanks. <laughs> oh, look at that. Thank you. Nice. library um, library expense account which is what yep. we use to purchase our materials um, last year we see, received a big bump in it that we've been asking for for many years and we're really grateful for that um, even though the cost of materials continues to go up um, the fact that uh, the town gave us this increase is the first year um, that we've actually been able to decrease our fundraising request um, as you both know we, we tend to have to ask for a considerate a considerable amount of money from um, our generous donors and neighbors um, each year in order to meet um, state minimum purchasing requirements and we were able to request only $10,000 this year as opposed to um, $16,000 was our request last year so thank you very much for the town to, for supporting us and hope you're able to provide little funding again so we can continue um, this wonderful trend um, for the library building operating um, we are requesting um, a slight increase just an additional $1,657 um, and that's really just to cover the increased cost of supplies and services um, our buildings in wonderful shape but every year we have a lot of minor um, repairs that come up uh, yeah. that can't be uh, anticipated or covered in capital requests um, so you know just we um, recently had our um, one of our doors need to be fixed. Um, you know, so there's just little things like that that pop up. Um, so we're hoping that funds can go towards that. Um, and then also we have a, a, our staff are um, cleaning the building in between, um, at least once a shift um, during when the library's open, cleaning the computers. And so we're going through a lot more cleaning supplies. Yep. And so we would Sanitizing like to cover that. Everything. Yeah, yep. <laughs> as well, because um, we didn't used to need that, and now we do. And I just anticipate after the pandemic is over, um, the hygiene standards will remain high. Great. Um, for the support staff, we are asking um, for a larger increase than past years. Um, one request is that um, we receive a 6% cost of living increase. Um, and so that's with the caveat that, of course, we will support whatever the personnel committee puts forward for a cost of living increase. Um, but as Jeff mentioned, um, that there's a huge um, inflation is 5% this year. Um, the federal cost of living increase is 6%. That was what they're, they're recommending. Um, so that's why we have requested that. Um, but we're also asking for additional hours for one of our staff members. Um, and so even though you guys are requesting, um, you know, 
level services budgets. Um, I think that this is level service um, for the town of Sunderland to give this employee an extra four hours. Um, the head of adult services position is um, really our de facto um, assistant director in a lot of ways. And a lot of other libraries, even of our size in similar towns locally, will have an assistant director or a position of comparable that will um, will you know take on those duties in the absence of the director. Um, this past year, we had to have this employee step in to assist <laughs> um, while I was on leave. Um, and this employee's done this twice before, um, and it's been seamless. They are an outstanding employee, um, but without even um, I mean, without even having this employee there, this position needs to have these additional hours, um, regardless of, of whoever is doing that. Um, and the reason for this is that um, we need to give them additional time off desk so that they can complete parts of their job that they're not able to complete in the hours that they're provided. Um, and we also need to have someone who is responsible and knowledgeable enough to serve um, as an acting director hmm. when unexpected absences come up so that our services can continue to be seamless for patrons. They won't even know that there, there is a difference. Um, and so that's why um, we are requesting that. Um, there certainly would be a cost to the town because this is going from a very part-time position to a slightly more part-time position where you would need to offer this employee benefits. Um, so uh, obviously that's why there's the sliding scale of the, you know, the cost to the town with that. Um, but I do think that it would, number one, make this position more desirable. Um, should we ever need to replace this employee, it makes it um, something that someone can commit to, be dedicated to, and hold for a very long time, which is something that we have very much appreciated with this employee that we've been very lucky to have for so many years. Um, and it also will help us attract a candidate that's qualified for it because the head of adult services is a supervisory position. They do higher level reference work and they, um, you know, also do all the purchasing for our adults. There's a, you know, a lot that goes into this position and we do need a qualified um, candidate in that role. Um, and so offering extra hours would really be helpful for that. So to the viewers out there, you're asking for four more hours a week, right? Yes, and four so more what would that bring them? Like, what would they be going from and to? From 16 to 20 hours yep. a week. So it's a you know it's a very small increase in terms of hours, but yep. in terms of work that they would be able to provide for the town, I think it's a huge relief. Um, it would save us from having to have someone come in on off hours to fill in when they need to. It, it you know it really would provide a lot of relief that. Um, we wouldn't have to be cramming everything yep. into into 16 hours is, is very difficult um, sure. for a, a you know a, a position with this many responsibilities a little more scheduling flexibility yes. and everything yes definitely yep right, i think we've gone with the pandemic too that you know to have a person you know and just in general it's it's you know we're a much better place if we can have someone that is so you know can just jump right into the position yeah can really run the library when you know, someone up here when Catherine's not there, the head is there. It's just been, yeah, it's really become apparent to us. Keeps right? a smooth transition. Yeah, and it's, yep. it's, it's really important. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay, great. Um, and then the only other line is the director salary. We were also requesting the cost of living increase of 6% was yep. anticipated, but of course we'll, we'll support whatever the personnel committee decides upon. All right. Um, I know we've got finance committee members on there. Do you guys have any questions at all? Or anybody else, actually, for that matter? Are you calling on me? Uh, I'm not calling on anybody specific. I'm just saying. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. That, then go right ahead. I didn't see your hand up. Sorry about that. Oh, I think you're on mute. Hi. Hi. Well, I'm just, I'm Beth Berry and uh, I'm on the Board of Trustees and I wanted to just say about the um, Head of Adult Services um, that that it's not just, you know, when, when Catherine was away, but uh, the 
person has stepped in more than once when we didn't have a director at all. And uh, we need somebody to be able to do that. And uh, that would be a position, you know, you could call it a, uh, an assistant director or associate director, but um, we need somebody that's able and, and capable to do that. And so that's why I would just want to speak for the increased hours for this position. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, are you looking for a title change at all? Or anything, I have or a just... question. Oh. Sorry. Nope. Um, we're, we're not looking for a title change at this time. Um, okay. We it's the same position and the, yep. the same duties that this person would be doing, um, but they they do do a lot similar to a, an assistant director. Okay, all right, thanks. I'm sorry, who had a question? Linda? Uh, Linda Forte from the Finance Committee. Hey, how are you? Go ahead. Hi, um, I, I am a full supporter of the library. I think it's wonderful and, and um, we're very fortunate to have them. My only concern is just from a mathematical point of view is that um, if this individual does need health insurance, we would, and, and there are two people who needed health insurance, so it was a family or whatever, um, we could hire a circulation assistant for 12 hours a week for a year for what it would cost with the health insurance. So I know we can't discriminate against an employee simply because this person needs uh, insurance, but if we kept this person at 16 hours, we would be able to hire a circulation assistant for 12 hours a week that would then enable this person to have four hours away from the desk um, to get other work done. And, and I'm not, I don't mean this as a negative or anything, just Thank you, Linda. So I, um, you're absolutely correct that we. Um, you know, hire an additional circulation assistant at the same cost. However, we would not necessarily receive the same level of work necessary. I mean, it's so essentially we would be adding a redundant position um, to give someone four additional hours off desk. Um, so I don't think, in terms of efficiency and in terms of long, long you know, the long term, that it, it makes it makes sense financially to hire. Um, a, a circulation assistant because um, what we really really need is to, is this person and this position to have to have more hours and in terms of um, you know anyone having this position and having and expecting that level of work from them we really do need to offer them a considerable amount of hours um, you know so the 20 hours a week makes it so this position is something that someone can can maintain and, and have for a long time, and you know, obviously the health insurance is part of that as well. Um, but I think you know, adding a circulation assistant wouldn't they wouldn't have any of the, the skills that this person would have. So even though it would allow the person, you know, four hours on the off desk, um, our patrons wouldn't have access to um, their reference expertise. They wouldn't have access to their technology expertise, and essentially we would have. Um, you know, this person's off desk hours would probably be interrupted so that they could go assist patrons, and it just didn't, doesn't necessarily make sense in terms of workflow for the library to have a, another circulation assistant when um, we have a qualified person who can who can do the same same and more. Can we really value this this position that it is the 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 fact, the fact that this person can seamlessly go into being the head? you know, to, you know, helping out and, you know, running the library at times, and it, that's a position that we need to support and we need to, um, you know, offer this to. It just can't be, you know, this person does more and can, can do more, and that's what the position needs, really, is the, the time and the, you know, 
Not just a body, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's 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 critical. It really is critical. And like I said, we really you know it's been over the past four years. We've really discovered that it is really that. And um, we're we've been very lucky so far, but we may not be so lucky. So you know, we all know how tough it is with the labor market out there. And this yeah. just makes so much sense than to you know. Close the library, but you know, just to do other things. So, just <clears throat> yep. Lauren, you have your hand up. Yeah, this is Joel Wise. I think you're talking about my hand. Oh, <laughs> Joel Wise, Finance Committee. Uh, a couple quick questions. First, a statement: the Library in Centerland. I'm very proud of it. You guys are amazing. Your current staff, so helpful. The activities you do, awesome for kids. I don't know as much about the adult um, activities, but you must be looking for this person to help um, improve that area too. So really appreciate that. I'm curious, because also we should look at income. What For donations, what roughly in an average year do you get in income for donations to the library? Um, I mean, it, it's a kind of a complicated conversation, I guess, because okay. we, if you're talking about donations to the friends of the library who Great. support us, that's they're an independent organization, so I can't really speak to their financials. Um, but we do have a, a gift fund at the library that people sometimes donate to. And we probably, you know, there's a lot of different, it's not just donations, but, you know, like uh, people paying fines for, um, you know, for lost items, that goes in there too. So it's probably 3000 to $4,000 a year that that goes into. Um, but the friends of the libraries are separate, and we can't count on that that money to be given every year, um, and, and or count for what's going to go for it. You know, that's that's their their determination. Sure, no, I totally understand that. But there's no on average a couple extra thousand dollars, or is it more than that, less than that? I mean, do you have just a rough idea. What yeah, I mean, that? so the um, the town provides us with. Um, I would say about two thirds of what we need to make to meet oh. state purchasing requirements, and the other third, the friends of the library tend to, to put forward. And that's pretty good. Good. And then the next question, just I know you want this to be attractive. With just twenty hours, are you going to be attract able to attract the person that you need for just twenty hours a week? Or, Not necessarily. We'll, <laughs> um, on, honestly. You know, a full-time position I think would be a lot more desirable. Um, but I do think 20 hours and benefits really makes a big difference as opposed to a non-benefit in 16 hours per week. I, I think that's a lot more attractive, um, personally. Just. And will this, if this, if this hire came through, would it affect any of the current staffing? Would anyone have to be let go? Would anyone move on? No, no. This would, this would still provide level services um, and. Level, level staffing, I guess. It would just um, increase our ability to, to provide better services. And it's the same person. It yeah, it's, it's, it's the person that's in the position now. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Again, you guys do a wonderful job. We're very proud of our son in the library. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to, to sort of address Linda's um, question. I think that it's um, something that we discussed when we put the um, request in and that it was the trustees determination that it was more important to make this position more attractive and to serve the purposes that Catherine explained rather than just add hours at a, at a lower level. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, Catherine, I think the last two years you talked about the increasing cost of digital subscriptions and ebooks and and how there was hope that maybe those costs would go. And I just wanted to know if, if there's been any update on that and if you've seen over the last two years people moving more towards that. And I know you offer, I think. Um, streaming videos and movies as well and um just you know i, I guess has the, have the cost decreased uh, have, are you moving more towards a digital like collection or how how is that going yeah so um i won't say we're moving towards a digital collection um we are certainly seeing um digital
digital services be the highest area of growth um, in the past year, past two years, past five years. Um, that seems to be where people are moving towards. However, um, I would say 70% of our circulation is books, and that doesn't include DVDs, audiobooks, magazines, and other hard items. So I don't think digital is ever going to completely replace um, our, our physical collection. Um, that's definitely still used and appreciated um, by, our, by our patrons. Um, we have been increasing our purchases of digital materials. Um, our consortium does um, does provide the majority of our digital materials, but the streaming videos through Canopy, we pay for that ourselves, and then I also will purchase additional high demand um, e-books and um, the audio books and, and things like that. Um, and the, um, actually, I, Senator and um, the representative probably could have talked about this. There was actually a hearing um, at the state, uh, the state house recently. Um, Massachusetts is considering joining, I think it's Rhode Island and New York, um, in making demands that uh, publishers provide ebooks to to libraries because there's a lot of publishers that won't put out their new releases to libraries. They won't make them available at all. Um, they'll yeah. only be available um, to people who can purchase them individually, like through Kindle or something like that, um, which is rather unfortunate. So I'm hoping that um, that will go forward and Massachusetts will will continue to support that effort. Um, but yeah, the publishers are not particularly generous or cooperative, um, and yeah. they, they continue to be wildly expensive um, and not particularly accessible. Um, but. We're definitely moving more towards streaming, um, especially for video. Um, our DVD circulation has, has been quite down, so I'm, I'm looking, investigating other options besides just the canopy. The canopy has been very popular, but um, looking to offer more as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions at all? No? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you. Please Thanks. let me know if you guys have any other questions for the demo. All right, great, thanks. Great. Have a good night. You Thank too. you. Looks fabulous. <laughs> good framing. There you go. All right, next up on our agenda is, as we often do every year, a request to deficit spend snow and ice. Our snow and ice account. Yes. So, uh, there are two spending requests, one for um, wages related to snow and ice removal and one related to materials. Um, I, I think that uh, typically the highway department would uh, wait until a little bit longer, but um, the, we've had some repairs that we've had to do on uh, the sand belt and some of the hoses that um, increase the cost and then next month um, because of various vacation schedules and the likelihood of snow in February we wanted to uh, put the request forward earlier rather than um, later when it might get a little bit complicated so essentially um, uh, let's see there, there's a request for Fifteen thousand um, dollars to deficit spend the snow and ice expense account, and then uh, is that the same? Uh, yep, I pulled up the same thing twice. So um, oh, I think I maybe uploaded the same thing twice. Maybe not. Uh, oh, and 10000 in the wages. Sorry about okay. that. And it looks like somebody's trying to join the Zoom. So I'm going to switch back here. Yeah, because despite the fact that it hasn't been too bad of a winter with snow and ice, we still have well over a month left. So. Yeah. Yep. Anybody have any questions on that at all? 
And for the finance committee, which does not have a quorum anymore. It was. Um, I guess maybe that's just something to consider for the next meeting. <laughs> to, yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm guessing you would like a vote on that. Uh, yes. <laughs> Please. I know it's hard to see who's got a hand up. I know, it, and I, I don't know if that didn't get cleared. Do, do you have a question, or is that just from, the, from your previous question to the library? No, I, I didn't turn it off. Sorry. Okay, no, okay I, I got it for you. We just sure. didn't want to forget, oh, that's you. all. Just making sure. So thank you for checking. Yep. All right, do we have a motion to approve the... I motion we approve the deficit requests for snow and ice removal. All right. I'll uh, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Two to zero on that one. Okay. And next up we have a discussion of the Boston Post Cane recipient. Yes. So our, our current um, Boston Post Cane, which I think you can see right up there. slightly <laughs> in the camera. Um, uh, moved out of Sunderland and so the town clerk informed us that um, of that and who the current oldest resident is which is um, Miss Helen Rodak um, and so typically the oh man I should have printed out my whole history um, but, but the very brief history of the Boston Post cane is that uh, the editor of the Boston Post gave out canes to a number of New England communities to give to uh, their eldest male resident at the time although I think in almost all communities it's been just the oldest resident now um, and it was a promotional thing, and it's some a tradition that continues to this day in Sunderland. And so, um, if the select board approves to uh, award the cane to Miss Rodak, um, she wasn't able to be here this evening. But um, we would go present her, not with the cane itself, because it's got this beautiful case and it stays here. Um, but we do have a commemorative pin and a certificate um, and some flowers that we would give her uh, later this week. Uh, Good brush up on the history, Jeff. I'm impressed. There you go. I had to write the press release uh, yeah. until I learned something about it. <laughs> See? There you go. Hey. All right. Do we have a motion? So I motion we present Mrs. Rodak with the Boston Post game this All week. Right. And I'll second. All those in favor? Hi. Hi, and congratulations, Ms. Rodak, and be visited by our select board chair and maybe one or two other members, depending on schedules, so fantastic. All right, great. All right, uh, next up, we just have a regular placeholder for ARPA discussion. I think we're going to put off any major votes or anything until next week, but I don't know if you had any, anything else you, you needed to discuss or... Um, not, not... Particularly, uh, the Capital Planning Committee met last week uh, with the superintendent and the um, facilities director to talk about the capital requests. And I think that helped clarify um, what some of the more immediate needs for the school might be for the elementary school, um, including replacing the PA system, um, potentially replacing a boiler there were there were some questions about um, and, and I think it, it started actually here when the schools presented but about the energy efficiency of the building and potential renewable energy sources and so I think that the discussion was um, and this relates to ARPA funds as far as immediacy but what um, what part what projects should be looked at further um, for example there's an oil tank replacement or a spill containment and if we're looking to move away from oil um, there was also discussion of the school potentially needing a new roof in the next couple of years and what about solar on the roof 
So I think that started a, a larger conversation around energy use at the school yeah. uh, that's going to need to be investigated further. But there were some things, you know, uh, the rim band around the, the base of the school needs replacing. Right. Next that doesn't have that. anything to do with energy. So is that, you know, uh, so next week we'll be talking about some of those um, needs of the school that, that pr probably need to happen sooner than later. Um, also went through the... Uh, public safety requests, um, things like the provided more information um, that you can talk about next week, the need for defibrillators, also put in a request for this building in the library and the highway department for defibrillators and AEDs. Yeah. Um, so I think that it just narrowing the list down, um, I, I what I took away from the conversation a couple weeks ago or last week was really um, let's look at our, our highest time needs right. and talk about those first since we have three years to um, spend the money. So um, that, that's what I'm trying to do now, bring a more condensed list. And then as, as we go through that list and we either approve or disapprove, add more um, yeah. or... Yep. Update the last so yeah because right because we don't have to decide everything we don't right have to now. spend it all today yeah, exactly. no nope, we don't even have it all as they mentioned well, that's right. so <laughs> yeah, we're we still can't yeah. excellent point all right great <clears throat> all right uh select board updates <clears throat> anything um, exciting crystal planning board meets tomorrow oh, yeah. so i'm sure we'll have personnel there you go. Personnel. Personnel. Yep. It was a P word. Yeah. <laughs> Planning board next week, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Personnel meets tomorrow, so I'm sure right. there'll be right. additional discussion on those wage adjustments, yep. cost of living increases, things like yes. that. Yes. Yep. It's a big topic everywhere this big year. Big so. topic. Yeah. Um, okay. I, we had our capital planning at last week, and then I also had the Frontier Capital Planning Committee. Um, and then just before this, I was on uh, the Union 38 negotiations meeting. So that's still uh, busy boy. still in process. Yeah, that time of year, you know, fun budget time. Uh, Sorry, jump in. That I did have yeah. this time. <laughs> yeah. Can I just ask one question about the ARPA? It's something I was thinking about the other night. Does it have to be spent totally on um, capital, or is there any way someone can be put aside for endowment to endow maintenance, or endow is it able to be used in an endowed sort of way, so you collect the interest and use that for ongoing income? I don't think you can do it for an endowment, right? That actually has to be expended on items. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. You for some of the specific things that they said you can't do is put it into a rainy day fund, put it into a stabilization fund, put it away for OPEB liabilities. So I think they want you to. I mean, I, I think the goal of the federal legislation is to get money flowing, and so they exactly. want us to spend it. Right. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, to help us out and then also help the economy out. Yeah. So you could do it on a maintenance item, for instance. You know, if it was something like that, that you know. Right, but yeah, I don't. But I don't think you could. You know, like are you thinking like a trust model where you put in yeah, a big chunk know, of money and use the interest? Yeah, like eight thousand a year to yeah. upgrade stuff or to you know to main, maintain something. But yeah, that we can't do. Like you could spend it on you know. A, an expenditure right. or something, but yeah, yeah unfortunately and I think, we can't do that with the trust funding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm going to head out. Is that okay? Fine. We don't need finance. Can we no. Have you? you guys are all set. We're all done with our okay. budget topic. So. Perfect. Thank you. You guys have a nice week. Thanks. Thanks. Hey. You too. Bye. All right. Jeff, town administrator updates. Um, just a couple updates. I am 
Really, really hoping that we're uh, gonna be submitting free cash this week, finalizing Ooh, yeah, it. Oh, so nice. um, hopefully we'll have. Oh, I'm. I really hope I'll have that number for you on Monday. Excellent. Um, if not, I'll have an update of when that number <laughs> will come. Okay. Um, we are closing out our coronavirus relief fund. That was sort of the first tranche of funds that came out with FEMA at the beginning of the pandemic yeah. um, and flowed through the state. And so they've accepted that what we think we spent and what they th the state thinks we spent match. So that's that, good. That's, good. that's a good um, step. Yeah. So we, need to, we need to finalize everything. Um, and hopefully that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. So that's good. Um, and then the the last thing I wanted to mention, um, which I'm sure the chair would mention if he were here, is that today is the uh, first day for the new senior center director. Um, so just oh. wanted to, sh hopefully she's not still in the office watching this, but welcome uh, Jennifer Remillard, who's the new senior center director. Um, on her first day and we're really excited that she's on board and um, looking forward to what she brings to the position. Excellent. That's good to have that position filled now so they can focus on moving ahead. So that's yep. excellent. Yep. Absolutely. Great. All right. Do we have um, any public comments or questions? funny I've been in I don't know how many meetings today and it's been like this in almost every meeting <laughs> it's, you know it's quiet and that's crickets it's interesting. I know I know it's interesting all right um, all right well, well with that our next meeting will be next Monday February 7th can't believe tomorrow will be February and yeah. for all you groundhog fans that'll be Wednesday for all you groundhog fans that'll be Wednesday a little subtle groundhog <laughs> But otherwise, um, I guess uh, I'll I grudgingly agree. accept the motion to uh, I adjourn. I motion we adjourn. All right. I'll uh, second and uh, let's see, uh, call us out at 7.33 p.m.